right in the next speaker. And uh, first of all, I'll say I met uh, Jeff Chen at a something called TED Talk. And uh, it's kind of like a TED Talk but for friends. It was at someone's house. And he uh, <coughs> did a great talk on uh, does your mom make endocannabinoids? You know it? Yeah. Excellent talk. I think there's a book that says that was on the list. He's going to be talking about the future of cannabis research and science. So, Dr. Jeff Chen, MD, MBA, the director of the UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative, where he leads a team of over 20 faculty members to conduct groundbreaking research into the effects of cannabis on society, including health, legal, economic, and social impact. He is a thought leader on the intersection of cannabis policy, science, and business, where he has worked for the last four years to accelerate cannabis research. Dr. Chen has presented extensively on the topic of cannabis, speaking at institutions ranging from the Land Corporation to the UCLA Center for East Coast Medicine to Senator Feinstein's office. He was a co-instructor at UCLA for one of the first cannabis courses at the American University. Dr. Chen is a David Geffen uh, Fellowship recipient, UCLA Anderson Fellowship recipient, and UCLA Open Entrepreneurial Award recipient. You don't have to read the right. Oh, yeah. 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 There's there. a lot of stuff there. It's a perfect time. Can everyone get some stretch real quick? Have they all been sitting for like an hour? Just stand up. Raise your arms up. Pull one arm over. Stretch one way. I feel a lot better. Stretch the other. Oh, my shirt came on top. It's fine. Cool. All right. We're just all sleepy. It's Sunday night. Um, so first off, this is this was the case. As you can see, the title slide probably from about six, seven months ago. I've since graduated in June. I uh, went to medical school and business school here at UCLA. That's where I've really been doing a lot of advocacy for uh, getting cannabis research started here. So these are, um, I don't know if you guys saw these, uh, the cover of Time Magazine and National Geographic News back in 2016. <laughs> Within one month of another, these kind of came out. And at the time, this was an issue that was a very hot topic in the media. It's still to this day a very hot topic. So let's dive right in. There's a lot of stuff that Michael covered, so I'll skip over those things down, down, down. Great. So, a few things we're going to talk about today. We've had this unprecedented mass cannabis. Um, this is a massive health experiment. <coughs> what can we learn from it, both the positives and the negatives? Today, we talked a lot about the positives of cannabis, but I don't think there's anybody in this room that would say there is not a single potential detriment to cannabis, right? It's just you got to kind of tease it apart. What are the pros? What are the cons? Um, you know, these Schedule One drug restrictions really hampered academia, but we have a multi-billion dollar industry that's now pushing the envelope forward. And in many situations, they know much more than academics do. They've been giving it to patients, they've been juicing it, they've been making all sorts of different delivery methods. How can we learn from them? Um, and lastly, what are some novel funding sources? Michael talked about the lack of funding. Um, and what are some novel ways that we can study cannabis and kind of circumvent these federal research? So uh, Michael talked about this. Uh, there's this guy in China that talked about cannabis. Funny thing, this is ma. So dama in Chinese means marijuana, but ma yao in Chinese means anesthesia. So and it's the exact same character. So they were already recognizing the anesthetic pain relieving properties thousands of years ago. Actually, if you tell this to a lot of Chinese people, they're like, "Oh crap, you're right." <laughs> you just put two and two together because again, mainly resulting from the opium wars. Any drug use in China is by execution, very serious. Um, eventually started in China, made its way to the Middle East, India, Europe, and then popped over the pond to the US, where in 1850 it was listed in our pharmacopoeia, which at the time was kind of the official standard setting uh, guide of all known uh, synthetic and herbal products. And then cannabis was officially listed in 1850, and it was listed for tons of conditions, actually, some of which are not too surprising today. Right. Uh, Make cannabis tinctures. Okay. So, let's talk about some of the mechanisms, which again, Michael has touched on, so I'm not going to um, uh, belabor it too much. Uh, but, so first off, let's talk about what's in cannabis. So, we have cannabinoids, actually over 100. Today we talked about THC and CBD, but there's actually over 100, the vast majority of which have never been put into a cell or an animal or a human. Um, some other ones that we do know a little bit about CBN, CBD. G, THCDA, right? We know a little bit about these, but you know, all of the literature published 
um, on these other minor cannabinoids, maybe a few dozen papers. Very tiny. Now, another area which is very fascinating are, are the terpene content of cannabis. So cannabis is particularly abundant in terpenes. That's what gives it the aroma. So when you smell cannabis, you're not smelling cannabinoids, you're smelling terpenes. And terpenes, while they are abundant in cannabis, they are not unique to cannabis. Anytime some, a plant smells good, you're smelling terpenes. Okay. Um, and these are all also known as essential oils, and they have physiologic effects. They have anti-inflammatory properties, they have uh, antidepressant properties, they have anti-tumor properties, so these are physiologically active compounds. And we'll talk more on the second why this is important when we go back to why it's hard to study cannabis and why cannabis is not THC, it's not CBD. There's hundreds of compounds at play. There's that patent we talked about, the title of the patent that was flashed very briefly with Dr. Osho, is cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. Um, and this was actually filed back in 2003. It was based on research that was done at the NIH some 15 years ago. And if you read the body of the patent, they talk about how it can be useful for ischemic diseases, which is when you have lack of oxygen flowing into an area of the brain, age-related inflammatory autoimmune diseases, or the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases, because it's a neuroprotectant. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Pretty fascinating stuff. Um, now, we talk a lot about CBD, um, and CBD is really interesting uh, for many reasons. So certainly it being non-psychoactive is really interesting um, and avoids a lot of the controversy and stigma of THC, uh, but as well as arguably having a potentially wider range of therapeutic properties. So this is actually a quote from Dr. Volkow that runs NIDA. And she was called in front of Congress back in 2015 to testify as to why CBD was restricted, why we weren't doing more research. And she basically goes and says CBD could be useful for seizures, oxidation, neuroprotective, anti-inflammatory, analgesics with pain relieving, anti-tumor, actually shrinking, killing cancer cells, antipsychotic. Actually, there's been some human studies where if you give CBD to schizophrenics, it actually acts as an antipsychotic. And it's in the handful of studies that have been done. It looks to be as effective as our currently used antipsychotic medications, except it doesn't cause all these awful side effects. It doesn't cause any pain, it doesn't cause you know, all these issues in anti anxiety properties. You have no significant side effects of a wide range of dosages. This is very exciting. Um, uh, how do these cannabinoids work? We have these endogenous uh, cannabinoids that we make. Um, and so, the cannabinoids in cannabis are mimicking the endocannabinoids the body is actually making. Now, the system, believe it or not, okay, now how old do you guys think this system is? Ancient. How ancient? What are you talking about? Thousands, uh, thousands of years? Like, more than so um, yeah, 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 that's actually, yeah, that's not. Yeah, so what? So give me some years. Let's throw some years out. Uh, two million. Okay, so somewhere, actually right in the middle of there, about 400 million years ago, we think the endocannabinoid system evolved, and it's actually preserved in all vertebrates. So anything with the spinal cord, so this is fish, birds, reptiles, frogs, uh, uh, sea sports, um, all make endocannabinoids. Okay, so this is an ancient root system involved in a wide variety of functions, and some of these don't come as a surprise if you're familiar with what cannabis does. So things like memory, stress, appetite, immune function, right? We're talking about the anti-inflammatory properties, pain, sleep, they make a lot of sense if you're familiar with the action of cannabis. Um, uh, and so, yeah, endocannabinoid system is pretty fascinating. I'm not going to dive too much into the details there because we are a little short on time. Oh, another rumor. Uh, people think that... Um, you know, so endocannabinoid system evolved some hundreds of millions of years ago. Cannabis only evolved in some tens of millions of years ago. So while there is has been some co-evolution, it's not so much that like we were dependent on cannabis to receive these external cannabinoids for the benefit of our bodies. Most likely, this plant came along and realized that by evolving these, it somehow could hitch a ride. You know, maybe animals enjoyed the effects these cannabinoids gave them and would therefore go and eat flower of cannabis and then poop the seed out somewhere else and that's how cannabis spread. Or maybe it's the opposite, maybe it's a deterrent. Maybe you eat it and you didn't like the way it felt and so you would avoid, you know, damaging the flower and, and, and you know, damaging the seed like that. And no one really knows. Um, and the other interesting point we talked about THCA being non-psychoactive, that is true, but some
some of the ways that you might actually feel something when you ingest raw cannabis could be a few things actually. So THCA naturally will degrade to THC based on heat, sunlight, exposure, dry. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is you know when you're juicing um, cannabinoids, this effect that you're feeling it might be it might not be a psychoactive effect driven by the THC, but again some of these terpenes are are physiologically active. They can alter mood. And it could be that there's some of these other minor cannabinoids that might be psychoactive. Like THCA is, or sorry, THCB is slightly psychoactive, right? And then the other thing is we're finding that CBD and your stomach acid can actually turn into THC. Um, so that's why some people, if you ingest tons and tons and tons of CBD, you might just feel some psychoactivity. It could be that THC that's being converted to THC in the gut. Is it understood how that? After molecules drop going from THCA to THC, that happens pretty easily. It sounds like yeah, heat, any sort of energy. It's so it's fire, a match over the exactly. It's heat that's breaking that carboxyl group off. So when you juice it, you're not in theory. In theory, you're getting THCA. Right, but if I took fresh cannabis and I tested it right now, it might be 23 percent THCA, two percent THC. So there's a spontaneous degradation that happens. So that is heat. Spontaneous. Just pretty, sit down with someone. Just sitting. It just starts to exactly. 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 The longer it sits, the more it might be. It's unstable almost. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is fascinating. Uh, so this is actually a paper two years ago, also from research out of the NIH. Basically, they, they went and looked at all of the evidence about the endocannabinoid system. And this is if you can figure out a way to modulate the system, right, to impact the system, you could theoretically be treating almost all diseases affecting humans. Right? So cannabis and cannabinoids are a modulator, but not the only one. There's many things that modulate the endocannabinoid system, exercise modulates it. But finding NSAIDs, things like ibuprofen, might actually be in part modulating the endocannabinoid system. So diet, exercise, other molecules can modulate the endocannabinoid system. Um, but still, there's a lot of therapeutic potential here if you just figure this out. Here's some of the terpenes that I mentioned earlier. So there's things like um, beta carotene, which is also found in black pepper, that is an anti-inflammatory, right? And it's also CD2 agonist. It's actually hitting some of the same cannabinoid receptors that connect that some of the phytocannabinoids from cannabis are. Um, other cannabinoids like myrcene, uh, found in hops, I believe, um, is also uh, an anti-inflammatory. So again, when we talk about cannabis and this whole idea of whole plant, again, I'll, I'll, I'll bring this up again towards the end when I talk about what they're doing in Israel and Canada. We're not just talking about a single cannabinoid. There's this whole slew of potentially therapeutic compounds, which is great on one hand, but makes research very difficult if you're dealing with all of these variables. Okay, so here, here's an example. So they did a study in Israel where they took pure cannabidiol like synthetic cannabidiol, and they compared it to the same amount of cannabidiol, but taken in a whole plant extract from a strain called Abadecol in Israel, high CBD strain. So same dosage of CBD in both treatment arms, but the Abadecol had the minor cannabinoids, it had all the terpenes in it as well. And what they found is they found drastically <coughs> drastic differences in how, in this case, they were looking at inflammation in a mouse model. And they found that it had a very different effect. So they found that the pure CBD actually demonstrated a um, bell-shaped dose response curve. So it was non-linear. So at low doses of the pure CBD, you had high inflammation. At some moderate dosage of CBD, you had a reduction in inflammation. This is tumor necrosis factor, which is a marker of inflammation. And then at high doses of CBD, you actually have a return of inflammation. Okay, it's a pure CBD molecule. But when they did the whole plant, Compound, it found more of a linear dose response curve, so it would just look like this. The more you use, the more inflammation goes down. So there was the title of this paper is Overcoming the Bell Shaped Dose Response Curve Using Cannabis Extract instead of just CBD. Okay, so there's something here, right? There's, again, there's something going on here. Um, okay, so now going back to what are the most sophisticated cannabis operators in the world? How are they? producing their medicines. Um, so on the most sophisticated are probably the Netherlands, but also Canada. These are companies that have poured 
tens of tens of tens of millions of dollars. It's a state-of-the-art pharmaceutical grade cannabis cultivation facility. You go in and it's in the suits, right? It is, it, it, it is sterile in there. And the whole idea is that they realize that, again, it's not just about THC, it's not just about seed, it's this idea of whole plant medicine and this whole idea of strain-specific uh, plants. Let's create a strain that we're finding is very effective for Crohn's. Let's find a strain that's very effective for PTSD, et cetera, et cetera. And once we stumble upon that strain, we got to make sure that we can grow it identically batch to batch. Absolutely identically. We got to control moisture, you know, uh, energy uptake, the nutrients in the soil, the pH of the water content, every single thing. And then once, we, once we've standardized the growth of it, then we got to standardize the extraction of it and make sure that we're putting it through a CO2 extractor each time at the same temperature and pressure so that what we hand a patient in a pill, while it is a complex mixture of 200 different chemicals, it's the same 200 chemicals every single time. This is very difficult. Incredibly, incredibly, incredibly difficult. But for the first time ever, and like people have tried to do this for um, herbal medicine, like Chinese medicine, people try to kind of grow it very similarly and extract it very similarly. But if you look at the value of a lot of herbs, cannabis is incredibly expensive Earth. People get the, the cost, the, the amount of money that people want to pay for. So for the first time ever, there's actually a market that allows them to pour fifty million dollars into a cultivation facility to be able to produce this medicine. It's pretty fascinating what ground is being broken on this. Um, in Israel, Israel, despite having the most experience treating patients, years and years and years, decades, they've been treating patients with cannabis. Their cultivation sophistication is just in the least. It's pretty low tech. Actually, whereas in the Netherlands and Canada they have very high tech cultivation, the minimal experience treating patients. Actually, in the Netherlands, a lot of their cannabis was being sold and used recreationally, so they weren't really meticulously logging data and all this stuff. But if you go to Israel and you go to a company like Takuna Lam, they have 20 different strains, and they'll try to tell you which strain they believe, based on their data, is good for PTSD versus inflammation versus sleep versus epilepsy. Now, how accurate are they? I don't know. Are they even growing it consistently each time? Probably not. Right. Okay, so um, why the impetus to study cannabis now? So first off, we're talking about this. Unprecedented access. And in fact, if you go, if you fall on just the CBD-only states, there's almost, almost all Americans live in a state that have somehow passed legislation regarding either recreational cannabis, medical cannabis, or <coughs> Okay, so it's pretty, pretty unprecedented. Um, here's a map of all the states. As you can see, the states that haven't adopted medical cannabis but have adopted CBD tend to be you know, the Bible Belt and more conservative states. <clears throat> but they've legalized CBD mainly for kids with epilepsy. Uh, California, we've just gone legal. But to show you how important that was, okay, so before, we, we had about, a, a, we estimated about a million Californians that had their medical reps that were buying cannabis legally. That number just jumped to 27 million who are over the age of 21. So we had about 3,000% increase in the amount of people in this state who can legally buy cannabis. That's massive. 3,000% increase. Holy cow. This is a, this is a massive experiment. Um, we now see the globalization of cannabis. So Canada is going wrecked in six months. Mexico just legalized medical. All these countries in Europe just legalized medical. All these countries in South America have legalized medical as well. So we can see that this is, this is a trend that is going to continue around the world. All right, so what's the current research landscape talking about? Michael talked a bit about this. Talk about these research barriers. We schedule on drugs, which include cannabis, include LSD, heroin. We talk about these schedule two drugs, which include cocaine, opium, methamphetamine. Right? It's pretty, it's pretty hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and even among schedule one drugs, it's easier for me to get LSD as a researcher than it is cannabis. Because with LSD, there's 10 different companies I can call and order LSD from. So if one company's out of stock, I can call another. So with cannabis, for 50 years, I'm stuck with this one monopoly of cannabis. And if they're out of inventory, or if they're being slow, or if they don't have the cannabis they want, it doesn't matter. I'm stuck with it. There's no incentive for them to offer good customer service. Right? Uh, what does it mean to have deal with schedule one drugs? You gotta wait six. 12 months to get a special license from the DEA. You have to have a special state safe that is of a certain grade, and the room has to be strong enough that no one can drill through the walls to steal your cannabis. 
Uh, everybody that works in the lab has to be trained in a certain way and have background checks to make sure that they're not going to steal the cannabis. And once you go all of this and you get your Schedule 1 license, then you order cannabis from NIDA, then it maybe shows up, maybe they're out of stock, maybe it has mold in it, whatever. And then your Schedule 1 license that you just want to do all of this, all of this headache for, it expires at the end of your research project. So it's not tied to you as an individual, it's not tied to an institution, it's tied to a per project basis. And once I complete that mouse study, then I go and spend another six to 12 months to get another Schedule 1 license to do another follow-up mouse study. To go through all of these things. And that hasn't changed in 50 years. <laughs> um, again, we talked about this monopoly. It's actually a NIDA-funded farm located at the University of Mississippi. And they aren't allowed to introduce outside genetics. So they've been forced to breed and reread the genetics that they started with in 1972. So that's why it's hard to get certain strains there. The content, the cannabinoid content is very low. Um, they actually get paid a lot of money too. The University of Mississippi got 70 million cultivated cannabis. So you can see why they also don't have an incentive to allow the expansion of, of more approved cultivators. So Maha. You know, the, the guy that runs this place is here all the time saying, like, we have everything researchers need. We can make anything and everything. We're the one-stop shop solution to so his lab getting 70 million bucks uh, to do this. All right, so uh, we'll talk about hemp a little bit. And hemp's really interesting. For, it's a game changer for a few reasons. So um, in 2014, we reintroduced the legal growing of hemp in America. We introduced it on a very small pilot research scale. So it's not full blown. Anybody can grow hemp now and go about wow. It's very specific. Institutions of higher learning, especially universities, and state agriculture departments are really the only ones allowed to grow hemp. The real spirit of this law was for people to grow hemp for textile and industrial purposes. And they wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to wreak havoc on the environment, that it wasn't going to create some crazy mold outbreak uh, or like plant fungus outbreaks that might spread to other crops. So hence why they did it on a small research pilot scale. Um, what they didn't contemplate is that they defined, they defined hemp as cannabis having less than 0.3% THC. They never mentioned anything else about the other cannabinoids. And so <coughs> this is when a whole industry popped up, the hemp-derived CBD industry that said, hey, we're going to grow hemp, we're going to take CBD out of it, and it's totally legal. It's not cannabis. This is all sanctioned under Section 7606. Okay, so it's great. Um, and this is really exciting, though, because I've had many conversations with the legal team, not just at UCLA, but at the entire UC Regents office, about how the heck can we do research on at least CBD, if derived from hemp, and bypass all the Schedule 1 nonsense of cannabis. And again, it's still gray, the lawyers are still trying to figure it out, but it offers some potential pathway forward. Again, you can do research unencumbered on phytocannabinoids for the first time ever in, in the last half century in America. So I think it's very exciting. Um, the Hemp Industries of America is suing the DEA to specifically have the DEA say that hemp is fully legal, anything other than THC derived from hemp is fully legal, including CBD. So they are in federal court right now suing them. The Hemp Industries of America won a lawsuit against the DEA in 2003, also on the issue of hemp. That because they won that law, that actually allowed for the importation of hemp seed and hemp oil and all the stuff that we enjoy in our day to day now. So we'll see how this turns out. If they win, great. Researchers are off to races. CBD is no longer Schedule 1 drug, including the void. Although the DEA still contends right now that CBD is a Schedule 1 drug. Okay, we talked about, so we talked about um, the hemp CBD angle as a possible way to accelerate research. But what about, you know, all this data that's being generated right now? California just went legal. All these people can buy cannabis. But in America, there's about 30 million Americans who are using cannabis at least once a month. There's okay, so 30 million regular users of cannabis. That number is only going to increase now that the 27 million people in California kind of just went online. So there's data being generated all the time by these people's own usage. There's also the emergence of standardized cannabis products. So before you had all these state legal programs, people would just buy, a, buy some dope on the street. And use it. You had no idea what was in it, right? And, and back then, there also weren't smartphones and actually a lot of activity. But we've solved all those issues. So there's now access. There's 
now, you know, in your pocket lies a you know, device that's more powerful than any supercomputer any world government had even like 30 years ago. So there's ways for you to, be, to log your consumption, there's ways that you can track, indirectly track whatever outcomes that you think you might be getting. So we have things that monitor your sleep, so we have things that monitor your activity levels, right? There's now um, natural language reasoning, like semantic uh, programs that can try to gauge your mood based upon the way that you write a text or an email. So now are we tracking people's anxiety over time? Are we tracking people's depression over time? And how can we correlate that with their cannabis use? And now that we have the emergence of um, these standardized products, for the first time ever, I actually know what you're using. Right? You can just take a photo of like the packaging of your cannabis pen, and I can actually pull up the lot number or the batch number and know exactly what was in there. <coughs> so I think this is very powerful. There's a way that we can pull off this crowdsource study. And this is something that I've have been wanting to do for years, and now it's actually looking like this is a possibility that we have all these factors, all these stars aligning for this. Um, and it's something where the industry could get behind too. And maybe the industry is encouraging their customers to go download this app, log your data, actually figure out what's going on here. Um, and this is not something that hasn't been happening before. Actually, so who's, who here has heard about the dialect? Okay, so there's a company, GW Pharmaceuticals. They actually grow cannabis in the UK and they make medicines out of it. And they've been doing this since the early 2000s. They have one approved medication called Sativex. It's a one to one ratio of CBD and THC that's approved for multiple sclerosis throughout Europe, but not in America. Okay. So they have this product already on the market. And then around 2013, 2012, they started getting emails from parents who were like, hey, I know you make this product that has some CBD in it, uh, you know, have you thought about using this, making a product uh, with CBD for kids with epilepsy? My daughter really improved on CBD. So they started getting all these emails. And the company, like, we, this is, wasn't even on our radar. Because they started getting all these emails, they started doing some research, they find all these videos online, and they went and decided to pursue this. And a few years later, Three years later, they got Epidiolex, which is about to be FDA approved in America, a pure CBD based product for rare forms of pediatric epilepsy. This is a perfect example of some people on the internet sharing some videos, kind of figured out through crowdsourcing this is something that was worth pursuing, and these guys picked it up and ran with it. Okay? So, you know, this isn't the end all be all. There's tons of biases, observational data is flawed, there's the placebo effect, right? Confirmation bias. But this points us in the right direction where we can take our limited amount of resources to then actually ask those questions about it. Okay. okay, now let's talk about money. Right? How do we fund all this? Schedule one drug, there's, no, there's federal funding for harm research for cannabis from NIDA. There's, no, there's very little no federal funding for therapeutic research. So where are we, we going to get the money from? Um, private philanthropy is a brand new area. So about two years ago, some Australian billionaire donated thirty million dollars to the University of Sydney for cannabis research. He had a granddaughter dying of seizures. He gave her CBD. She got better. Boom! Gave him thirty million dollars. By far the largest gift to cannabis research ever. Probably second place to this was someone donated a hundred thousand dollars at some point in the past. You know, if even like massive, massive private gift. Uh, foundations are also getting on board. All these foundations have supported cannabis research in some way or another. Now, the amounts aren't big, probably thousands, maybe some tens of thousands of dollars that shipping in, but it's, it's coming online. Um, corporate philanthropy. So Jefferson University got over a million dollars from a coalition of uh, five or six cannabis companies in Pennsylvania to start their cannabis research program there. Okay. And we here at UCLA, we just got fifty thousand uh, dollars from a cannabis software company. The check came in about a week ago. It was our first big donation. We've been around for actually I didn't even talk about what we're doing at UCLA. I'll say that for the end. But we we're, we're now seeing corporate philanthropy um, bringing in funding. Lastly, the state of California, all this tax revenue flowing into California is going to spit off ten million dollars a year to broadly study the impacts of legalization of cannabis legalization. And this isn't just health, right? This is like social, economic, environmental, etc. Health is a 
very small component. Frankly, I don't think much of this 10 million is going to go towards, it's not going to go towards studying the therapeutic potential. It'll go towards probably studying the public health implications. What happens to car accidents? What happens to mental illness? What happens to XYZ? So I'm not, but it's good for other things. And only California public universities are eligible. So I'm hoping that we can position UCLA to capture a lot of this money to study the economic, environmental, cultural, and social impacts. Um, so yeah, takeaways, unprecedented access. There's this massive experiment unfurling in front of our eyes. Academia really doesn't know much else, much about this plant. The industry knows a ton. How can we work with them? How can we learn from them? Um, we can talk about some novel funding sources that have popped up, never before seen funding for this type of work. Um, we talked about hemp as a legal source of cannabinoids that allows to bypass schedule and drug restriction. And lastly, this idea of how can we crowdsource uh, cannabis data. Cool. Uh, so I guess the last thing I'll end with is talking about uh, what we're doing here at UCLA. So about four months ago, we started the Cannabis Research Initiative here at UCLA. Uh, we're funded and housed uh, in the School of Medicine, specifically in the Semmel Institute. Um, and, but, we all, but since then, we've already formed a consortium uh, with five other schools at UCLA to basically cover every aspect of cannabis. So now our mission is how does cannabis affect society, period, on a broad scale. The health piece is something that I'm most passionate about as a physician, and that's also, I think, the most timely and relevant issue of this. Um, but again, we're looping in the schools of public policy, public health, law, business, and study all these broad questions. My priority and our priority in organization is the health piece. And specifically, the main sub priority of that is actually the opioid issues. You know, Dr. Oz was there. I didn't even realize who that is. I'm actually going to try to pin him up again on the show after I saw that. Um, but the reason the opioid thing, I think, is so powerful, he actually summed it up very well. Like that, we have to strike while the iron pot. It's a national emergency. Everyone's talking about it. So, certainly, if this can help, it's going to help millions of people. There's 2 million people in America who are addicted to opioids. That number going climbing, driving an overdose every 15 seconds. It, every 15 seconds, someone's overdosing. Uh, oh, sorry, 15 minutes. My God, sorry. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. 15 seconds. Still a lot. 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 Right? But that's how powerful the algorithm is, bending the life expectancy curve of an entire nation. And it's not slowing down. If you look at the trends, the right, in terms of 60,000 people, 60, people a year, more people die in one year from the opioid epidemic than I think in the Vietnam War. Yeah. Americans, not even worldwide, it's for Americans, right? So cannabis is interesting because, again, observationally, we see that states that legalize cannabis see about 25 medical, not recreational, medical about 25% drop in overdoses, we also see physicians prescribe with opioids. The idea is that physicians are probably being like, well, maybe you should try some pot, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's one. Now, if you look at the root causes of why it might help, for a few reasons, there would be chronic pain element. Um, it might help with the symptoms of withdrawal, which can be very displeasant for people. Um, there's also this opioid sparing, opioid sparing effects of cannabinoids in cannabis. We've actually observed. So if you take, uh, we've done this mainly in animal studies, but a few very, very uh, strict lab experiments with humans. But if you take a human and you're like, they need X dosage of opioids to achieve a level of pain relief, if you give them some cannabinoids, you're able to take that and give them a small fraction of it. And the idea is that, you know, cannabinoids are opioid sparing. You give somebody on opioids with cannabinoids and naturally they just produce amount of opioids to take, less opioids to take, less of uh, no dose. And then the last part of it, this is very, very, very preliminary evidence, we're finding that cannabinoids also have anti-addictive properties. So again, mainly animal studies, a few, like one or two human studies, but this was done for, specifically, the one I'm thinking about is CBD. They showed that if you give CBD to mice, they crave less um, opioids. If you give CBD to tobacco smokers, it looks like they smoke less uh, cigarettes. Um, and then I think, uh, so 
So opioids, nicotine, and we'll say the third category that they did was for ethanol, alcohol. So if you give cannabinoids uh, in controlled settings, you give more cannabinoids, alcohol is desired to some alcohol goes down. So for all these reasons, oh, actually the last reason is cannabinoids are anti-inflammatories. So in the opioid effective cycle, both chronic pain as well as long-term opioid use causes a lot of neuroinflammation. And we think that neuroinflammation makes your pain feel worse. It also makes it harder to get off the opioids. And cannabinoids are actually pretty good at reducing neuroinflammation. So we think that can actually cut off the vicious cycle as well. Um, but going back to why the opioid epidemic, so I'm finding now uh, it resonates with a lot of potential donors as well. And so really our priority, for many, many reasons, our priority is to conduct the world's first clinical trial where we administer cannabis to pain patients who are addicted to opioids. We'll see what happens to opioid use. Um, and so if, if the results of the study are positive, we can see how this might actually lead to the descheduling of cannabis. Because you have a national emergency. We've proven with a gold standard placebo randomized controlled clinical trial that these people are benefiting, they're reducing opioid usage. And so everybody is going to be calling on the national on the federal government to allow access at the federal level. And the only way to allow access is to deschedule it. Not, or sorry, reschedule it. I don't think they're going to deschedule or reschedule it. But what happens as soon as you reschedule, you're not eligible for federal funding. Right? So strategically, we get this one study through. We're going to have to cobble together about $3 million bucks for it. When we get this one study through, we've unlocked billions of dollars in funding for all the other stuff that we want to do. And that's kind of like this strategy in my mind. Um, and the last point that I want to make is that, you know, we talk about the medical benefits of cannabis a lot. We don't talk about the harms as much. And again, certainly there are harms, right? We've got to, we've, we're still trying to figure out what they are exactly. It's certainly been exaggerated, but it's not a harmless compound. Um, you know, one area that some people are concerned about, and they should be, are young people who are predisposed by schizophrenia, right? Probably shouldn't be using cannabis. Um, driving while intoxicated. Not good. Again, it's not as bad as drunk driving, not nearly as bad as texting while driving, but it's certainly not going to make you a better driver. Right? I think we can all agree on issues like that. Um, other areas that people might be a little concerned about cannabis use during pregnancy. Again, probably not as bad as using other things while pregnant, um, but it's probably not as bad as you know, We're finding some correlations between um, cannabis use during pregnancy and low birth weight. Lower birth weight. Those are some areas that, off the top of my head, that we have to be cognizant of the harms. Um, and it's always a balance between, you know, as physicians, we're always balancing. Every time we give you a drug, even if it's Tylenol, there's a chance to give, you know, just totally crap out your liver, right? Um, so we're always trying to risk what is the benefit of the CMV, and then what is the harm? If the benefits outweigh the harm, then you go forward with it. So the cannabis is the same thing. We're always going to be asking ourselves this question. So, thank you very much for that. Um, and I'll open it up for questions. Yeah. What we know of as mainstream medicine, or happy medicine, was started in the early 1900s by the Rockefellers. Mm -hmm. And it was designed as a business, which means that our medical system was designed to maximize profits as a patent medicine company, the Rockefeller was developing. And they went after the competition uh, in the beginning and the ruthless and uh, destroying uh, people who were actually doing it because from a business perspective, you need the competition for the uh, profits <coughs> the companies. Uh, and you can see went after medical schools that were uh, offering uh, other than homopathic uh, methodology. The goal of the business is to maintain their monopoly and to maintain their profits to be as high as possible. Um, they, ever since the early 1900s, uh, monitor, uh, provide, and blackmail politicians at the state and federal level um, to follow their line to maintain their profits. Uh, if there's a, a, a legislator that uh, is really compassionate and wanting to. Legislation 
certainly possible. Um, GW pharmaceuticals, they grow the plant and they grow it very identically. But when they go and make their medicine, they, at the end, are just basically purifying out the cannabinoids. I think their initial intention was to try to do the whole plant and it got too difficult to standardize. They ended up, rather than making like a uh, consistent oil with 200 different chemicals in it, they're like, screw it, let's just like try to get to the pure cannabinoids. Um, so we're seeing a whole like 2.0 version that's happening in Canada right now. Uh, I think it's certain that's certainly possible. Um, it's just at what point, at what point can you still make profit? I think the, the production costs for some of these Canadian companies they're producing at like ten dollars a gram. Right? Yeah, yeah. A lot of you look shocked. Yeah, and that's like what the retail price is for Canada. Exactly. That's like what literally what a store is selling. Them. But again, if this is medical, then we enter a whole other realm of what people pay for their medicine, like thousands of dollars, you know, tens of thousands of money. Then they can't support that. So it's certainly possible. No one's quite cracked it. People that are closest, it's maybe. Uh, so, Jeff, you mentioned that you have a It's going to be one modality, it's going to be one pool in the master pool that will incorporate, there'll be some, yeah, it's just in the pool. Okay. It's not the end all be all by any means. Um, it's not a panacea, you know, we, it's rarely, it literally cure anything anymore, it's just going to be a better option with certain options, whether it's less toxic or more effective. I need to be an example. I have problems and I have a little bit of a and then my colon is in I have that and I have more, but I mean, my pain, my pain, it's never going to cure me. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to bring my colon back or anything like that. But I think it might help to be kind of like pain to let it be able to function better. So, you know, yeah. I mean, there's a few considerations. As to how it can be just a, how it can benefit medicine, benefit society, right? But certainly the cost, if we can make it cheaper than certain patented compounds. Um, in certain situations, it might be more effective than what we have out there. Um, and then third parties, uh, it might be a safer alternative. Um, so, you know, opioids, you know, overdose, and overdose of cannabis, but all the way to uh, even things like ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is actually. Drugs like ibuprofen, ibuprofen, aleve, aspirin, they're one of the leading causes of death in the elderly. Because you get a lot of uh, bleeds in your stomach. You don't know until you kind of go to the hospital and you find that you're like, about to die. Um, so, for those reasons, cheaper, uh, more effective, and potentially uh, safer alternative medication. Mm -hmm. Any of those three areas is going to be benefited. Why do you prescribe prescriptions and other medications? You're right. Yeah. Well, I think it's just it's just medical medical care in general. Before you cross the death. You go in the hospital for one thing, you catch an infection, there you die. That's the thing. Check mark. So, you know, I, I, I literally just graduated high school six months ago. I don't even see patients the same way that cannabis clinicians. Like David Beerman, the guy that's been interviewed, he sees cannabis patients all the time. He's just doing this stuff. Um, so it's a, it hasn't entered, obviously it has not entered the mainstream medical acceptance. It was an idea that was first pioneered, I believe, by Ethan Musso, Dr. Ethan Musso. You should read his stuff. He's great at hearing this. Um, I think there's certainly some truth and validity to it. It sounds like the things that we call the diseases that we give a name that might most that might be actually this endocrine disease syndrome, things like fibromyalgia. Um, that's a really big one that we see. You know, if I pick one disease that we call something that actually might be due to lack of endocrine, it's fibromyalgia. 
It's because you see this weird constellation where it's affecting your sleep and it's affecting your mood and it's affecting uh, your response to pain. And again, going back to what are the things that the cannabinoid system is involved in, slash, what are things that can just treat? And actually, you find that by the patients, uh, one, a lot of them are using cannabis, precisely for this reason, um, is that all of the drugs we're throwing at them aren't really targeting the smoke. Yeah, yeah, it's totally there. Um, and I know what you're, you must be thinking, like, why can't you just show that to... Well, I mean, there's so many of the studies, you have to look down and do the you know, and then take everybody else. Yeah, right. Well, you know, these studies were also done... There. Here's how they, here's their argument. So first off, they say it's cannabinoids. We're not saying cannabis. We're saying cannabinoids, like THC, like CBD, have these properties. Just like how Marinol, the synthetic THC, is a Schedule 4 drug. You can go get it at CVS right now. It's just pure THC in a capsule. That's not a Schedule 1 drug. It's cannabis is. So in their mind, that's how they try to keep this dichotomy. Um, and the other thing is, a lot of these studies that were done were on animals. Right, or almost all, all the studies that led to that patent were done in animals. So, you know, you can sit there and they'll be like, well, show me the human data, and you're like, well, it's, it's not funny for it, it's really hard to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. Yeah, thank you guys for having me.